third uh, up, we have Sheila Block, who is the Director of Economic Analysis at the Wellesley Institute, an independent nonprofit research and policy think tank. Uh, Sheila is an economist whose research interests include labor markets, public finance, and health policy. Thanks very much. Um, so if Greg kind of gave us a, a theoretical and international context for the austerity that we're seeing, and um, then Tamara and her colleague kind of gave us a, a federal context, I'm going to dig a little deeper into the provincial area and also um, have a, uh, an even kind of tighter focus. Um, I work at a place called the Wellesley Institute, and our focus is on the social determinants of health, what are sometimes caused the, called the causes of the causes of ill health. And the McGuinty government, in tasking the Drummond Commission uh, to kind of come up with a human face <coughs> and austerity agenda, specifically excluded the Ministry of Health budget. Um, and I think one of the things that we've really wanted to be talking about over the last little area is that the impact that governments have on health move far beyond um, what's happening or isn't happening in health budgets. And, and I'm just going to back up a little bit to tell you, uh, remind you of the epidemiological evidence that's really clear that other social factors, uh, racism, sexism, employment, housing, those kinds of issues have a very concrete impact on people's lives. And uh, statistics, Canada evidence shows us that the lower income you are in Canada, the shorter your lifespan, and that moves throughout um, all of those income uh, measures. So it's not just, oh, those very, very poor people have a shorter lifespan than those who are right at the top of the income distribution. Through every step of the income distribution, you see a greater longevity and not only years of life, but years of healthy living. Um, and w more recently, we've had some pretty interesting research that says it's not only the, whether you're low income, but how much inequality you have around you and how much inequality you're surrounded by that has that kind of an impact on a large number of health outcomes. Um, so we had um, our most benevolent Bank Street economist, the uh, Bank Street economist with a heart, with a heart tasked to uh, protect health and education spending, spending um, but also not to increase any taxes. And I'm just going to talk to you pretty briefly, because I know we're getting close to lunch, about two impacts of the Drummond Commission. Um, one is the focus on social spending, and the other is um, just to try and speculate on what the gender impacts are of his recommendations. So in, in the world of Drummond, um, social spending includes social assistance, children's programs, child protection, youth justice, child care, and the Ontario Child Benefit, which is a targeted, um, uh, targeted spending measure for children who are living with low, in low-income families. And again, because um, Drummond is this kind of compassionate fellow, he exempted social spending along with health and education spending from the kind of draconian cuts that he had uh, recommended to the rest of the public sector. And we have to remember the context of this. He is actually recommending cuts that are similar um, to what we've seen in other areas, larger than any historic cut. So this is making uh, Mike Harris look a little bit like an amateur. So these are huge cuts, and they're going to have a huge and kind of profound impact, distributional impact, and impact on inequality in Ontario. Um, so to focus in on, on social spending and this, this uh, kind of uh, benevolent 0.5% increase as opposed to the decreases in other areas. Um, we have to put this in context that, that uh, the increase in social spending in Ontario over the previous 10 years had been 6% a year. Um, and so an increase in spending of 0.5% is a real per capita decrease in spending of 16% over the four years that he's talking about, or if you compare that 0.5% increase in spending with the 6% that it had been at, we're actually looking at a 27% lower uh, level of spending in Ontario on these social, uh, on these areas. So really a profound cutback in spending uh, in areas that really have a, a, a really big impact on, on the health of Ontarians. Um, so we know that there had been an Ontario Poverty Reduction Plan, and you can say, well, you know, part of that 6% increase in spending was to try and address poverty. Um, we do know that as of this point, um, the level of 
funding and the adequacy of social assistance is at a level where it's harmful to people's health. Um, and so currently we don't have adequate supports and social assistance so that people can maintain any semblance of health. And further cutbacks in, the, in that kind of a way will have a detrimental impact. Similar in terms of the kind of children's programming that he's suggesting these kinds of cutbacks to, we know that not only does those kinds of cutbacks have an impact on children at that time, but they have profound and lifelong impacts on health. Um, similar to the kind of federal context that we're in, there's a lot of talk in Drummond about how, you know, you're looking for administrative efficiencies and we're looking at better ways to deliver services and those kinds of uh, requirements. Um, and so when we looked at total all administrative costs in the Ministry of um, uh, in the Ministry of Community and Social Services, which delivers most of these programs, and the total of all administrative costs um, is actually 0.4 percent of total spending. So even if you didn't ever require any administration of any program whatsoever, um, you would not come close to meeting the kinds of cutbacks that, that you are actually looking for in a real per capita way um, from social spending. Um, so we have to be clear about what the impact, impact of implementing these kinds of recommendations are. Um, you are going to have a reduction of services for children who are at risk and in need um, that will have lifelong impacts. And with respect to social assistance spending, what you're either going to do is you're going to um, have a further real decrease in spending and income supports for people in this area, which means uh, kind of more suffering and more detrimental impacts on health. Or you're going to tighten up the eligibility criteria so that in this time of, of uh, high unemployment and much precarious employment, fewer people will be eligible for it. So. If that's just a, a digging a little bit deeper um, uh, into the social spending, and I had been hopeful actually, um, perhaps um, sort of hard to come out in this crowd, but I'm actually a neoclassical economist. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I had some hopes with the Drummond Commission. I thought, oh, the Liberal government is using it as this kind of straw man, and then they're going to look really benevolent because they won't be following through on any of those recommendations. Um, but it looks from recent reporting that they'll be following through on far more than uh, we would hope for. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about a little bit here is just the gender impacts. And there are really three to four ways um, that the proposed cutbacks have, a, have an impact, a differential impact on women as compared to men. And the first thing to rem remember about this is that women make up about 60% of public servants. Um, so there are four ways. One is the loss of public sector employment, um, and that can result either in those services being contracted out, because Drummond's a big fan of that, or you can just lose those kinds of public services. Um, and what that, in the first instance, what that results in is an increase in unemployment, and more unemployment for women than for men, because there are more women who are public servants. In the second instance, um, if you are unemployed and you're looking for employment in the private sector rather than in the public sector because your job has been contracted out or doesn't exist anymore, um, some excellent work that Toby Sanger, who's um, going to be speaking a little bit later today, has done showed that um, public sector employment for women's wages in public sector employment are higher than women's wages in private sector employment, and men's wages in public sector employment are lower than it is in the private sector. So what that shows is, is that if you're moving um, a larger number of women from the public sector into the private sector, you're moving them into lower paid jobs. And so their chances after they leave are worse than the chances for men after they've left the public sector. Um, you're also seeing what uh, is often referred to uh, uh, in health sector spending of a shift out into the community and that has you know kind of those warm fuzzy feelings about you know being closer to people um, and in fact what that and this is a sector the health sector uh, is a sector where the 82 percent of employment is actually of women and what that means is you move out of larger institutions where you are more likely to be unionized and if you are unionized you're more likely to have higher wages better benefits uh, including a pension and moving out to the community sector where if you are unionized, you're much less, you're going to have lower wages and you're going to have less benefits than you would in the larger institutions. 
So we have a loss of jobs, we have a, a, a decrease in the quality of jobs, and then we have who picks up the slack when we lose those services. Um, and what we do know is that um, it is women who, the responsibility for caregiving, either in the paid sector or in the unpaid sector, falls. So, so if you're looking at un uh, unpaid caregiving, um, larger proportion of women than men provided for unpaid caregiving work, and the num not only are more of them providing more caregiving, but they're providing more hours than the men um, who are providing it as well. So you're losing, your, you're losing paid work, you're doing that work in an unpaid manner, uh, and then the kind of work that continues to be available for you will actually be lower paid work. And I think it's really interesting, I don't know how much of this kind of mythology is left on um, what women's wages are used for. So I, I took a look at some of the StatsCan data um, that looked at the share of women's income in husband-wife families uh, of total. Uh, and I think what would be interesting, at least to some people in the crowd, is that there has been, of course, an increase in the number of women, uh, in the number of families where women's wages are more than 50%. But also, in Ontario, those increases are most pronounced um, in the areas where manufacturing has really been hollowed out. So if you look at Windsor, if you look at London, it's those areas that women's wages are most important, and often if those are um, public sector employment, wages from public sector employment, you're really kind of sustaining both those families and those communities. So I was going to leave you with something a little bit more hopeful, but, um, I, I, but I'm a little bit at a loss uh, to do that at this very moment. Um, I think that there is um, a real lesson for us to just move further down the road of despair uh, in looking at what's happened in the austerity plans in, in, in the UK where they are further along in the, in, in the road to austerity. They have a women's unemployment rate in England that is higher than it has been in 25 years and you have massive cutbacks to the kinds of services and uh, and women, both women's employment and the services that women rely on. So I guess my note of hope will be that perhaps we'll see the emergen the reemergence of the Canadian uh, feminist movement in response to these cutbacks. Okay. Thanks very much.